Uh, Carey was a minister in the Anglican Church during the 1960s in the outback mining town called Cooper Pedy. And Carey, during this time in Cooper Pedy, heard of a community called Mintabby, which was a remote opal mining town. If you thought Cooper Pedy was remote, well, Mintabby was even more remote. And this town had a reputation for being a wild and unruly place into which no preacher dare venture. And for a while, Kerry was put off entering um, in Tabby due to the stories of shootings and drunkenness and the reputation uh, of particularly one man called Ivan, who was said to have killed several people. Anyway, convicted by God to go, Kerry headed west on the 350 kilometre drive to this wild frontier. And then while heading down a lonely track on the way to Mintabby, he came across a broken down vehicle. He stopped to see if the man was okay, and you may have guessed it, it was Ivan, the man he was warned about. So the minister in the middle of nowhere was with the man he was warned not to go near. Well, Kerry was no mechanic, and he said that it didn't matter how much he prayed, he could not get that car to go. So Kerry gave this Ivan a lift to Mintabby. And as they drove on, Ivan asked who Kerry was and what he was doing uh, coming to a place like Mintabby. Well, Kerry gulped and replied cautiously, I'm a Christian minister and I'm coming to share Jesus and show some Christian films. And Ivan said forcefully, I don't go much on the Jesus bit, but no one had ever cared enough for a hundred men at Mintabby to show them pictures. And to Kerry's amazement, Ivan took him to the Mintabby restaurant. He arranged with the barman to show the films. Not only that, but Ivan went around and invited all the miners to come. And when uh, Ivan invites you to do anything, apparently you don't refuse. And that night, 65 tough opal miners turned up to watch the films. And they sat around drinking beer, asking how many naked ladies were going to be there. Well, the first film was Johnny Cash in San Quentin Prison, and they liked it and cheered. The second film featured Billy Graham, and Billy was only on the screen for 30 seconds when one miner sprang to his feet, kicked the car table over and stormed out, knocking the door off its hinges. Well, following that evening, Kerry continued to visit Mintabri every six weeks and he discovered that although these miners were tough and they were rough, they needed Jesus as we all do. And by God's grace, on occasions, Kerry would see some of them put their faith in Jesus Christ. This story is about a man who pushed beyond the fringe, a man who stepped into a new frontier with the powerful message of Jesus. The context of our passage, Stephen has been martyred for standing firm in the truth of Christ. And on the day of Stephen's death, there was a great upheaval and persecution broke out against the church. Saul, who will be later become the Apostle Paul, is unwavering in his attack on the church. From house to house, he's taking Christians and putting them in prison. Verse 3 says, Saul began to destroy the church. And destroy is a word that has been used to describe wild boars ravaging a vineyard. Well, Saul is ravaging the church, raging against it like a madman. In chapter 22, we know Saul had both Christian men and women dragged off and beaten. Saul was not like his teacher, Gamaliel, who had the wait and see approach to see if the church would fail. Saul wanted to stop it in its tracks. And as a result of this aggressive persecution, all except the apostles were scattered. And you can picture here the turmoil there must have been. Tens of thousands of Christians scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember Jesus' words at the beginning of Acts, Acts 1.8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. What's next? And in all Judea 
and Samaria. Acts 5.28 says the apostles have filled Jerusalem with their teaching about Jesus. The apostles have filled Jerusalem with their teaching about Jesus. They have witnessed Jesus in Jerusalem powerfully and comprehensively and now God wants his people to push beyond the fringe, to go into a new frontier and next in line is Judea and Samaria. And that's where the Christians find themselves in Judea and Samaria. They are thrust into this new frontier. Would the Jerusalem church have pushed out beyond the fringe by themselves? We don't know. But we do know our God is sovereign and his people are where he wants them. And right at the onset of this passage, we have a very good application. We should be thinking about new frontiers. How can I push beyond the fringe? For the Jews, it was in Samaria. For Kerry, it was into the town of Mintabi. For the Reformers, it was the Roman Catholics. For some churches, the new frontier might be an Aboriginal community or the homeless or the LGBTQ community or the Muslim community. Think about a new frontier God might be laying before you, somewhere where you can push beyond the fringe. Or you may have already been placed in that new frontier. In Acts 1, it says, all except the apostles were scattered. In Acts 8.4, it says, those who had been scattered. Uh, a guy called James Montgomery Boyce notes, there are different words for scattered in Greek. One means disperse so that the item is gone from that point on, like scattering a person's ashes on the ocean waves. This is not the word used here in Acts 8.1 or Acts 8.4. The word used here means scattered in order to be planted. God has scattered these Christians and planted them all over Judea and Samaria. God has planted you in that workplace, in that school classroom, that new neighbourhood. Pushing beyond the fringe might be you getting to know your neighbours. A new frontier for you may be perhaps a renewed frontier where you again re-establish relationships with your family. Think about new frontiers. Think for yourself personally, how can I push beyond the fringe? How can I break out of my safe bubble? To do what? Acts 8.4 those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So our next point, gospel proclamation with divine authentication. In verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And do you notice here that the big guns, the apostles, are in Jerusalem and it's the church, tens of thousands of them that are spreading the word, the Christians driven from Jerusalem are not described here as, you know, angry because of their persecution. They're not sort of complaining about being kicked out of their homes. No, they are all spreading the message of Jesus. And while it's true that only certain people are called to publicly preach, all Christians are called to be a witness and give a reason for the hope that they have. And yes, there will be people with special gifts like Philip, who's later called an evangelist, but all Christians here are spreading the word. Like the farmer who scatters seeds, Christians are scattered and planted in order to sow the word. And now the focus moves to a particular person, Philip, in Acts 8.5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. So who's Philip? He's in later, he later in Acts is described as an evangelist who has four unmarried daughters who prophesied. He's like, he, like Stephen, is, is one of those, the Fab Seven back in Acts 6, who, who looked after the widows. And he was one of those men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. Peter, uh, Philip, sorry, Philip had the right message. Jesus is the word we preach. Spurgeon said we have a great need for Christ and a great Christ for our needs. And before him, reformer Zindendorf said, I have one passion only, 
It is he, it is he. Philip is full of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't preach the Holy Spirit. He proclaims Jesus. It is that simple, yet at times that is such a difficulty to prioritise. A message needs to always come back to Jesus. Every message needs to centre on Jesus, for that is what the Bible is about. Uh, To quote Alastair Begg, We find Jesus in all of Scripture. In the Old Testament, he is predicted. In the Gospels, he is revealed. In Acts, he is preached. In the Epistles, he is explained. And in Revelation, he is expected. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And the results, verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. These signs were not only affirming and authenticating Philip's message, but they were revealing the kingdom of God is at hand. God's Messiah, the Christ, his king has arrived and his name is Jesus. And in the power of his name, verse 6, with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city, in that city. Joy because of their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And to highlight the reason for such joy, Philip now gives us a picture of Samaria before the message of Jesus came to town. Philip from verse 9 gives you a flashback of how dark it was before the light of the gospel broke through. Look at verse 9. Now for some time a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. We need to understand that Simon was no 21st century illusionist from an Australian Got Talent, Got Talent show. We're not talking here about someone doing card tricks. Simon was an expert in the occult. He accessed a supernatural power whose origins were not of God. In other words, he used demonic power to keep the city bewitched by himself and his craft. He was unashamedly a self-promoter. He, in in verse 9, he boasted that he was someone great. And in verse 10, all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is a divine power known as the great power. And they followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his magic. I read this and it very much reminded me uh, of a time when I was uh, in Papua New Guinea in remote villages. I visited uh, these villages and they were under the controlling power of the local witch doctor. And these places were very, very dark. This Samaritan city was very dark. He was under the control of the god of this age, the devil himself. This city was controlled by the power of darkness led by Simon the sorcerer. But verse 12, when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ, I'll baptise both men and women. At the preaching of Jesus with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many. No wonder there was such great joy. These Samaritans were set free from the power of the evil one. You know, their eyes are being opened, they're being turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified. They have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the sun. There is great joy and liberation in the city because Jesus Christ has set the captives free. Next in our story... Something unusual happens. In the next section, I have called Gospel Unification with Divine Authentication. And I'm going to read this out because we've got to get our head around these verses 14 to 17. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit 
because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Before we look at this, a few truths we need to be reminded of. The Bible makes it clear that all Christians have the Holy Spirit at conversion. Without the Holy Spirit, you do not belong to Christ, Romans 8, 9. We're all baptised by one spirit into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. To all Christians, the Holy Spirit is a seal of salvation, Ephesians 1, 13. And from other scriptures, including Acts, we know the Holy Spirit has been at work in the Samaritans' lives because of the miracles, the healings, the exorcisms are a work of the Holy Spirit for hearts to be open, for faith to be present to believe, and for regeneration to occur, the Holy Spirit need to be active in these Samaritans. These Samaritans are saved because the Holy Spirit has already been at work. So what do we make of this baptism of the Holy Spirit in verse, verses 14 to 17? Well, to interpret this correctly... We need to remember this is the beginning of the New Testament church. We also need to remember that narrative passages in Scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament are descriptive of what happened and are not necessarily prescriptive. In other words, narrative sections describe what God or someone has done, but that does not always mean we go and do likewise. So then, what is God doing here in this section by sending the apostles to Samaria so the believers can receive the Holy Spirit? Well, this is like the Samaritan Pentecost. Jews, in chapter 2, as believers, received the Holy Spirit at a later date and spoke in tongues. Samaritans, who are part Jewish, in chapter 8, as believers received the Holy Spirit at a later date. And since Simon saw the Holy Spirit given, the sign he saw could quite possibly be tongues, though the text does not say. And later, Gentiles who are non-Jewish in chapter 10 believe and receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And then John the Baptist's disciples in chapter 19 believe and they later receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. So for clarity, there are four cases where the Holy Spirit is given after conversion. One to full-blooded Jews, to part Jews called Samaritans, to non-Jews called Gentiles, and then to Old Testament Jews. Why? Well, in each case, it showed these individual groups were all part of Christ's church. They all received Jesus' promised baptism of the Holy Spirit. And importantly, this divine authentication revealed to the Jews that all these groups mentioned were to be part of the church. When Peter reported this Gentile baptism of the Holy Spirit occurrence to the Jerusalem church, this is what they said in Acts eleven eighteen. When they heard this, they had no further objections. And praise God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. And Acts 15, 8, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. The Jews saw this delayed baptism of the Holy Spirit as God's authentication that the church was not to be a Jews-only club. The church was going to include people from all nations, full-blooded Jews, part Jews and non-Jews. And these instances were to show the inclusiveness of the church. Uh, Back in uh, Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 54, John, who's here giving the Holy Spirit, John asked Jesus whether he would like him to call down fire from heaven to destroy an unbelieving Samaritan village. But now, there was to be no dividing wall between these groups. 
No longer would one nation, Israel, be God's witness, but the church is to be made up of Jews, half-bred Samaritans, non-Jewish Gentiles and Old Testament saints. The gospel unites people from all nations. Now that the unification of the church has been divinely authenticated in Acts, our final section highlights gospel opposition. Our final section, gospel opposition, verses 18 to 25. The New Testament church has faced many challenges thus far in Acts. Persecution to the point of martyrdom, Hypocrisy in chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Potential divisions in chapter 6 with the Hebraic and Grecian Jews. Also the problem of being distracted uh, from, the word and, from the word and prayer in chapter 6. However, the next problem for the church comes via a character named Simon. Simon practiced sorcery. He claims he was great, he amazed the people with his magic through deceptive spirits and the people followed him and exclaimed in verse 10, this man is the divine power known as the great power. Yet verse 13 says, Simon believed and was baptised. But his eyes don't seem to be on Jesus. He was following Philip and his eyes were on the great signs and miracles. And when Simon saw Peter and John give the Holy Spirit, his eyes again were on the power and he offered money and said in verse 19, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And in verse 20, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money? To paraphrase this, Simon, to hell with you and your money. Now, of course, Christians can make silly mistakes. However, Simon was likely not even saved. Yes, he believed and was baptised, but that does not always mean someone has saving faith. The demons believe but they are not saved. Faith based on signs is not a sound faith. Jesus had problems with sign-based faith. And did Simon ever receive the Holy Spirit? His heart seemed wicked. He was full of bitterness and captive to sin. And his focus was on the miraculous power for himself. And Christians don't perish, yet that is what will happen to Simon if he doesn't repent. Perhaps Simon's faith is a dead, barren worthless faith that James chapter 2 talks about. Perhaps Simon's belief is like the seed that fell on the rocky place or amongst the thorns. The text doesn't say, but if history is correct, Simon wasn't saved because he traditionally started up Gnostic heresies and went up to Rome and perverted Christian doctrine. Either way, there is a sin to avoid in this section. The word Simony has its root in Simon the Sorcerer, which is making a business out of that which is sacred. That includes the sin of selling indulgences, selling miracles, prophecies or blessings. Pay this and you'll get that blessing. There are, these are horrible and deceptive sins in the church, being proclaimed in the church in our day. Treating the Holy Spirit like some force so that you can have power and control to manipulate people and to be seen as someone great is one of those evils the church at large still battles with. Commercialising divine matters for profit is an appalling sin that we as a church or individuals should have no part in. Instead, we need to push beyond the fringe with the gospel, a message that reconciles God with man and unites people from all nations. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and do praise you uh, for that reconciling message of Jesus Christ our Lord.
We thank you, Lord, that through our faith in him, we can know you as our Father. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins, for life everlasting. And Father, we pray that you'll impress upon us the importance for others to hear that good news. Father, help us to be a church that is active in wanting to share that good news and the supporting of those who are in various mission fields doing just that. Father, we thank you for this word today and Father, we pray that you'll use it to continue to speak into our lives. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.